You're tuned in to the Investing for Beginners podcast. Finally, step-by-step premium investment guidance for beginners. Led by Andrew Sather and Dave Ahern to decode industry jargon, silence crippling confusion, and help you overcome emotions by looking at the numbers. Your path to financial freedom starts now. All right, folks, well, welcome to Investing for Beginners podcast. I'm Dave Ahern, and we have Andrew Sather here as well tonight. Tonight, we're going to do a review of an article that I came across from a blog that I read on a daily basis. It's called The Acquirer's Multiple, and it is owned by a gentleman named Tobias Carlyle. He's a very, very amazing writer, and he's written some great books, and he has this blog that uh, he's a member of that uh, one of his gentlemen that works for him writes some great articles. And the article that I came across, I shared it with Andrew a couple weeks ago, and we both really liked it, and we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to talk a little bit about a gentleman named Seth Klarman. We've talked about him a little bit in the past before, but this article that was written kind of outlines 13 tips on how to find bargains. Uh, Seth Klarman, if you're not familiar with him, has written a, an amazing book on the margin of safety, and it's unavailable, more or less. You can buy it on Amazon, I believe, for a cool $1,300 a book, if you wish. Uh, apparently, he did not release a lot of uh, copies of the book, and so it's very, very rare and very hard to find. I was fortunate enough to be able to find it. I read it through the professor of a local college, had it at a finance professor, was uh, kind enough to allow me to borrow it to read it. So, uh Andrew and I are going to kind of pick and choose through the tips that uh, the gentleman shared in this article. Uh, it's a commentary from The Collected Wisdom of Seth Klarman, and it's kind of a compilation of quotes from the Baupos uh, Group founder, Seth Klarman. His hedge fund is the Baupos Group, and he writes an annual letter just like Warren Buffett does, but it's not generally available to the public. It's usually only available to his, uh, you know, the people, the insiders, the people that invest in his fund. So... I'm going to read a couple of the quotes and talk a few few minutes about them, and then Andrew's going to do the same. I also will link to the article in the show notes for this episode so that you will be able to find this article and read through them as you wish and find some things that you might like. So the first one that I came across that I really like was, Great investments don't just knock on a door and say, buy me. Uh, That is so true. They do not just stand up and say, hey, here, buy me. I'm cheap. I'm going to make you tons and tons of money. It takes work to find great investments. There's a lot of due diligence that you have to put into to be able to find a great investment. You know, Andrew and I talk a lot about, you know, buying with a margin of safety, and this is a huge proponent of Seth Klarman's investment philosophy, and there is a lot of effort that takes to go to find these uh, bargains or these gems, if you will. Generally, they're not things that are readily available or that just kind of weep out at you. A lot of times you have to look under a lot of rocks to try to find, you know, the one that you really, really like. And I think that's a great quote. And I really, I really, that really struck me when I read the article. That was one of the first things that really kind of jumped out at me. Uh, the next one that I really liked was it's easy to find middling opportunities, but rare to find exceptional ones. Again, this is a great uh, quote that I think is very apropos for today with the market being at, you know, of course, all time highs seems like every single day. It's hard to find great opportunities, especially for value investors. You know, we're always looking for great companies that we can find at a discount so that we can buy with a margin of safety with the emphasis on the safety and trying to find exceptional companies that are on a discount when the market's, you know, really at an all time high. It's, it's a challenge. You know, you have to screen on a regular basis. You have to, you know, use all the tools that you have available, whether it's, you know, Andrew's, you know, value trap blog or whether it's, you know, the things that I try to do. You know, there's just so many avenues and ways that you can go to try to find opportunities, but finding something that's exceptional, it's not something you're going to do every single day. You think about the investors that Andrew and I talk a lot about that are, you know, mentors to us, you know, people like Seth Carmen. Manoj Prabhai, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, you know, Peter Lynch, any of those guys, you know, they didn't have, you know, generally their portfolios were not 
monstrously huge. You know, we talked a, a few weeks ago about Joel Greenblatt. He did have a very large portfolio, but he's more an exception to the, to the rule than normal. You know, Manish Prabhai, for example, I believe he has six or seven, you know, stocks in his portfolio right now. Guy Spear, who's another person that I really like, he has, you know, maybe 10. You know, Warren Buffett has a few, but he's also been doing this for 50 plus years. So, you know, he's had time to build up to a few of them, but the majority of his portfolio lies in a handful of stocks, American Express, you know, Wells Fargo, uh, among others. So, you know, finding the great opportunities is can be a challenge. And one of the things that Carmen talks a lot about in his book is when you find those exceptional ones is really piling them is really, you know, going big on those because that's where you're going to make the money is by finding the great ones and really, really betting big on the ones that, you know, are going to be exceptional, you know, finding middling opportunities that are going to make a couple of percents here or there, you know, over the long term, that's not ideal. That's not what we want to get because when you look at, you know, Things that are involved in that, such as fees, you know, the time spent, you know, trying to find that opportunity and missing the other opportunity, you know, there's an opportunity cost for those, you know. So these two quotes that, uh, you know, that I first read, those are the first two that really jumped out at me. Andrew, do you have a couple you wanted to share with us? I mean, I guess if you're going to twist my arm, then I guess I could say <laughs> something. But, I, you know, I really love those points. Obviously, having tools like a screener can be so crucial and like you said it has to be something you seek out it's not going to come and this is a this is one of those things kind of like entrepreneurship it's kind of like you know building wealth just in general it's it's like doing your fitness really anything you want to try to improve on it's something you have to seek out you have to be proactive about and you have to take the initiative and make things happen for yourself and obviously when you're talking about opportunities that's you know, especially on Wall Street and the stock market, that's undoubtedly uh, applicable. So this quote kind of relates to that as well. When buyers are numerous and sellers scarce, opportunity is bound to be limited. But when sellers are plentiful and highly motivated, while potential buyers are reticent, great investment opportunities tend to be tend to surface. So it's kind of a fancy way in his really smart way of saying that you want to buy low and you want to sell high. Basically you're going to have a lot more opportunities when the market is pessimistic, you know, and people are selling and, you know, just people are losing their jobs. The economy is not doing so well and people just don't want to be in the market. That's when you're going to see the most opportunity. So I think it's pretty obvious where Klarman stands when it comes to his investment philosophy and it's, you see this theme parallel through a lot of the different fund managers that are now billionaires and have been able to amass such a huge net worth because of the way they have been able to buy securities for themselves and their shareholders. And it's, you got to be a contrarian. You got to go against the grain. You got to be able to stand up and understand that the crowd's not always going to be on your side. And you have to be not only okay with that, but able to seek that and try to look for those kinds of opportunities and those kinds of situations so that you can get in and get the right kind of growth that you're looking for from a performance perspective. So I really liked that quote, and it's, again, a very eloquent way of saying one of the most principal fundamentals of value investing is that, you know, like Buffett says, you got to be greedy when people are fearful and be fearful when people are greedy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's one of my favorite Buffett quotes. I really enjoy that. Yeah, that, that was a very fancy way of saying buy low and sell high. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the ones that I liked as well was you must buy on the way down. There is far more volume on the way down than on the way back up and far less competition among buyers. It is almost always better to, to be too early than to too late, but you must be prepared for price markdowns on what you buy. You know, one of the things that I really liked about this quote that really kind of struck me is, you know, value investors tend to be a little bit more on the conservative side, I guess is a good way of putting it. And, you know, sometimes you get a little bit of the sky is falling 
uh, Howard Marks, who is one of my favorites, he he releases uh, memos every quarter, and you know the last three or four memos that he's released have all been fairly negative about the the market and whatnot. And he's been talking a lot about trying to get people to be prepared for a drawdown in the market. You know when things go poorly and people start selling, and you know this is when you can find great companies, and this is one of the things that you know, value investors kind of look for, you know, when the market is, you know, getting hammered and things are, you know, falling, 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 that's when you can find great opportunities. And, you know, when a market is high, like it is right now, as we talked about before, it can be difficult to find great opportunities. But when there's, you know, a downturn in the market, that's when you could find great opportunities. And, you know, he was talking about it's always better to be too early than too late. Uh, you know, you can never time the market. I think this is what he's talking about with this. And again, this is a, a you know, a very eloquent way of saying you can't time the market. And you shouldn't worry about waiting until you can find the bottom because you don't know when the bottom's going to be. And we've talked a lot about in the past about dollar cost averaging. And this is one of the things that you can do to help that strategy as the is, you know, going down. If you find a company that you think is really, really good, you know, if you're dollar cost averaging into that, that can help mitigate some of that downturn, additional downturn in the market. And he, you know, he talked about you, know, you must be prepared for price markdowns on what you buy. Even if you do buy, let's say, a stock starts off at, well, I'll just use an easy number, $100 a share. And then there's a downturn in the market and all of a sudden it's down to, I don't know, $62. And you decide, okay, well, I'm going to get into the company. And then maybe it drips down again to maybe $50. Well, you could also buy it at the $50 as well. And then maybe it goes down another 4 or $5 and you can decide whether you want to buy in at that time or not. But as it goes back up, if it will, as it will, if it's a, you know, a good company and it's just, it's only being brought down because the rest of the market is following suit, then that's where you can really make your money. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that I really like about value investing is it gives you a strategy that you can use when things are going well. It could also use, it can give you a strategy of when things are going poorly as well. Hey, you, what's the best way to get started in the market? Download Andrew's free ebook at stockmarketpdf.com. You won't regret it. Yeah, I love it. Kind of backpacking off of uh, what I said previously, there's a quote here talking about a bargain price is necessary but not sufficient for making an investment because sometimes securities that seem superficially inexpensive really aren't. So, you know, while at the same time you want to find these bargains and obviously that's the whole point of all these tips and everything we've been talking about value investing up to this point. He also cautions that, you know, there can be a reason why these stocks are cheap and you have to be able to identify the difference between a stock that's cheap because it's an opportunity and a stock that's cheap because it's actually in trouble. So that's why I have such a big focus when I talk about the value trap indicator and I talk about my research with the bankruptcies the idea of a value trap and the way that it can really negatively affect your portfolio is something that you cannot overlook. So understand that these bargains are going to show up in the market and it's not so much seeing a bargain and taking it, but it's more so taking that next level and being able to say, okay, I see a bargain. Now I'm able to foresee. And how do you do this? You, you, you use analysis, you use fundamental analysis. You dig into the, the annual reports and you look at the numbers and you understand what the ratios and the metrics are telling you and you figure out what's the big picture here with the stock. You do all of those things and then you're able to look at a bargain and perceive if it's a bargain because it actually yeah, it's a bargain and your chances of success are great or is it a bargain that seems superficially inexpensive as Klarman put it and actually isn't. So find out why a stock's inexpensive and use that as a judgment call whether to pull the trigger or not. I love it. That's that's so apropos. You know, one of Warren Buff, one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett was he said I like to buy socks I like to buy stocks the same way I like to buy my socks on a bargain. <laughs> and I thought that was yeah. that's awesome. Uh one of my favorite quotes from this little List was rather than buy from smart, informed sellers, we want to buy from urgent, distressed, or emotional sellers. 
And this, to me, harkens back to the discussion that Andrew and I just had about uh, unconventional investing principles. And we talked a little bit about your emotions in that episode and how they control your thoughts and how they control you know, what you want to choose to invest in, your thought processes behind that. And as we've talked about in other episodes, you know, when you buy or sell stocks based on emotion, that's never, ever a good thing. And, you know, we look for people that are going to be upset and that are making emotional choices because, you know, as we all know, when you make an emotional choices, you don't always make rational choices. And so, you know, the fear in the greed that we were talking about in the market, when there's a lot of fear in the market, that is when we can find deals. That's when we can find bargains. That's when we can find companies that are going to be selling at a discount, which gives us an opportunity to make a great investment and also helps us with a margin of safety. So if we do make a boo-boo and make a poor choice or make a bad decision, we're not going to get burned too badly on it. And so I, I think that was one quote that I really liked. Yeah, and keeping on that theme of kind of looking at the the buy side of the equation, looking at the price and, and the margin of safety, he has a quote here where it says, typically, we make money when we buy things. We count the profits later, but we know we have captured them when we buy the bargain. So this is obviously having confidence in the margin of safety or the intrinsic value you've calculated. But the kind of key underlying idea here that he doesn't say, but he implies is that not only are we going, you know, we talked about the principle of dollar cost averaging, but here this is more like a buy and hold type situation. So you have to look at investments over a long term. If you're buying with an adequate margin of safety and you know that you're getting a good deal, you're, you're getting this bargain and you're buying it at less of what it's really worth, then even if the market doesn't do what you want it to do or that stock that you bought, it doesn't perform in the way you want you don't take that to heart and you don't see it as something negative and you don't get discouraged and kind of sell and just give up on the position just because it isn't going your way. This is something you're going to count the profits later. You're going to hold over a very long term and either you hold until it reaches that value that you know it really is or you might even potentially and hopefully be holding it for even a longer time frame so you can be collecting dividends and, and seeing it appreciate even past the intrinsic value that it was at before. So what Klarman's saying here is he has the confidence and the experience to understand that by buying with this margin of safety, he's already making that money and it's just a matter of treating this investment just like all of his other investments, understanding that the market's going to go up and down, there's going to be cycles of fear and greed, and that all you need to do is hold over the long term, buy and hold your positions and things, you know, you're you you will see the profits, but you do have to be patient. You do have to stick it out and you have to be intelligent and wise enough to understand this type of difference. That's such an awesome quote. He's man. This guy's a smart dude, isn't he? <laughs> he's just, he's, he is, he, yeah. yeah, he's just, he's so no smart. wonder he's a billionaire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, the next one that I really liked was these causes of mispricing are deep rooted in human behavior and market structure. Unlikely to it be extinguished anytime soon. And this falls right into the ballpark of the lattice work of mental models. This, you know, the, the mispricing, you know, it is so deep rooted in our human behavior. We're always looking for, you know, something that is better than it really is. And we're willing to buy, you know, things because it's cool or because we think it's, you know, a great company or we fall in love with something and we'll go out and buy it irregardless of whatever we think the price is. And, you know, we think about when we think about value investing, it's all about finding, you know, the value. It's looking for what we think the company is worth or a pair of jeans. You know, how many times, you know, do you hear people talking about, you know, that they got to buy this pair of jeans because they're the coolest thing ever. It doesn't matter that they're exactly the same as the pair right next to them on the shelf. That's only 10 bucks, but these are $122. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, human behavior, you know, drives so much of 
pricing in the world and what we think we should buy and what we think we should want. And it's, you know, kind of comes down to that, you know, whether it's a, a need or a want and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, when we're investing, we're looking to try to be rational and we're looking at numbers and we're thinking about the value of the company as opposed to the price that the com- you know, that stock market is, is dictating to us what we think the company is worth and you know we you think about some of the companies out there right now you know i'm going to give you a couple examples of andrew and i have talked about many times amazon tesla uh snap you know snapchat you know which by the way is getting hammered in the market right now because it's not worth anything and it's you know it's overpriced but people got super excited about it and they bought into it because of an ipo and it was shiny and you know, it was the, it was the new shiny thing and they got into it and bought it and it was, you know, human behavior drove that. It had nothing to do with the actual value of the company. And, you know, marketers know this. They, you know, they play into our thoughts and our emotions and they figure out ways to, you know, I hate to, I hate to be so blunt, manipulate us to do the things we want. And the same thing happens in the stock market. You know, a company comes out there and, you know, the, the people that made money on that IPO for Snapchat would bank that cited, you know, that they would take this on to create an IPO for Snapchat and they marketed it and they profited hugely from that company going, you know, public. And, you know, it's just, you know, it really comes down to, you know, we have to be rational. We have to keep our emotions in control. We have to think about the decisions that we make and why we make the decisions. And we have to be aware of what we're doing when we're investing because, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous place. And if you make a big mistake, you can lose really big. And so, you know, being conservative, you know, investing with a margin of safety, the emphasis on safety, that is, you know, such a huge, you know, advantage for you when you walk into the market and you want to buy something. And I think, you know, keeping your emotions and your behavior under control is so crucial. Yeah. And it's really next level. This, this is really deep and I, I'm really glad you covered it. I think it's a really great way to end and it's something we should all be processing, even if you're just hearing it as, uh, you know, as, as this kind of advice is coming by, but if you can really internalize it, I think it can really take your investing to the next level. And I like, if you haven't read the book, if there's a way you can pick up Seth Klarman's margin of safety, obviously I think it's a fantastic resource. He does mention too how much of Wall Street nowadays is actually filled with marketers, uh, much more so than it is filled with finance guys or guys who are trying to actually do well for their clients. You know, they're they're trying to attract funds, and we, we've talked about that before as well. So. I think those are all things that you want to understand that not only is the market driven by humans and humans' emotions and the weaknesses and faults and biases that all come along with that, but it's also very much influenced and and fueled by money and the personal intentions and and the the there, you know there's just a lot of conflicts of interest when when you look on Wall Street and you look at the way some of these companies and firms and people, how they actually make their money. So it's definitely can be difficult to navigate, but educating yourself is so key when it comes to these type of things. And if you can not only educate yourself on Wall Street, on the market, on how stocks work, on how to analyze stocks, on how to become a value investor, but if you can take that next step and educate yourself about your own self and what type of biases and emotions you're going to be prone to falling under. I think it can really, really do some great things. And I think maybe that's one of the things that separates a guy like Seth Klarman or Charlie Munger from the average Joe who never accumulates that kind of wealth. I agree. That's, you know, very well put. Well, folks, I think that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for tonight. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on Seth Klarman and some of the 13 tips that he has created to help us find some bargains. I had a lot of fun talking about this, and I know Andrew did as well. There was a lot of wisdom that could be found out there in reading, in whether it's books or blogs or listening to Andrew and I talk. There's just a lot of wisdom out there, and you know, there's a lot of resources to help you become a better investor. We want you to go out there and invest with a margin of safety, the emphasis on the safety. And if you're enjoying what we're doing, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Give us some reviews on iTunes. We'd love to hear 
Without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and sign us off. You guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week. We hope you enjoyed this content. Seven Steps to Understanding the Stock Market shows you precisely how to break down the numbers in an engaging and readable way with real-life examples. Get access today at stockmarketpdf.com. Until next time, have a prosperous day. The information contained is for general information and educational purposes only. It is not intended for a substitute for legal, commercial, and or financial advice from a licensed professional. Review our full disclaimer at einvestingforbeginners.com.